years may, may have a massive impact. Um, the, the funny thing with the rule is that it says uh, if, you had, if you were a bid rigger in a tender, it doesn't say in a public procurement tender. So that's a major headache if you have a case which involves private tendering. That was the gas insulated switchgear switch case. Um, it was still before Hungary's accession. There was a, a linear application to the Commission and a number of national applications in Central Eastern Europe, including Hungary. And that was a big headache then. Do we submit, uh, does the company submit a leniency application for Hungary, um, providing evidence about rigging, in fact, private tenders? Does it risk an exclusion from public procurement? If so, what can you do about it? Um, the, uh, in the meantime, uh, clever practitioner, Budapest practitioners have uh, improved uh, ways of effectively managing these types of situations by effectively re-establishing companies, restructuring companies, because public procurement, the public procurement sanctions will not apply for the whole undertaking. They will only apply for the corporation itself. Public procurement does not have the notion of an undertaking. It can only apply for a legal person. But still, in a number of cases, this is, again, something which you, you have to take into consideration. All we talk about, you have to decide on within a matter of days. Uh, you think, and then you advise, and then you fly to a nice place. Uh, Unfortunately, I mean, again, I will have a bid for a number of companies to put their headquarters to Dubrovnik uh, <laughs> rather than, rather than uh, cloudy Brussels or Zurich or Vienna or Frankfurt, whatever. Um, and, and, of course, a massive point which, uh, which Mark has touched upon will be, will be private enforcement. And I'm mindful of the fact that there will be a very interesting session, in fact, chaired by... Uh, my distinguished colleague Zoltan Borakoni from Hungary on private enforcement, so I don't want to take away his, um, his topic, but in a leniency setting, you, you have to think about this. Hungary is, is, is in fact, a, a unique jurisdiction in the sense that um, two years ago, a, a presumption was introduced into the Hungarian Competition Act in order to boost private enforcement, which says that for the type of cartels we are now thinking about and talking about, so price fixing, bid rigging, market sharing, quota allocation, so the hardcore stuff, you have a presumption um, that the, the cartel, cartel's impact on the prices which the customers of the cartelist had paid equals to 10% of the price. So in a nutshell, you can call it a 10% damages presumption. Uh, it's a it creates a very plaintiff-friendly environment. Um, as Mark said, there has been a lot of forum shopping a um, lot of um, plaintiff organi well, organizations or pla plaintiff law firms from the states, CDC from Brussels, have looked at this and have considered that Hungary is a, is a good jurisdiction. Certainly in terms of substantive law, it is very attractive. Whether in terms of procedural law and uh, preparedness, of course, to deal with this, it's a very good one. I have doubts, but still. Uh, now, wh when you have a leniency, um, again, this is a striking element to think about. Again, back then, when this was introduced, it was very clear that you have to give something, quid pro quo. Uh, if you introduce a 10% rule, you have to give something for leniency applicants that protect them. Otherwise, uh, there will be zero applications. That's very clear. No one will move. Especially large companies will not move. Imagine 10% presumption, plus you're the deep pockets company. So on the basis of joint and several liability, mentioned by Mark, everyone will start suing you. And then they will say, well, do your contribution claim, recourse claim against your fellow cartelists. But you have the money, so sorry for that, but we sue you. Very clever, of course. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, especially then large companies will never make a leniency application. And then two rules have been introduced into the Competition Act. One says that as long as money can be collected from other members of the cartel, uh, the, the immunity applicants, so the number one, um, money cannot be collected from number one, which means a deep pocket company can say, I'm an immunity applicant, as long as you can recover, as long as plaintiffs can recover money from my fellow cartelists, the only thing I have to fear about is their recourse claim against me, which will at some stage, of course, happen, but... I'm not the one who has to pre-finance the whole thing. 
Uh, and the second point is that if you're an immunity applicant, num again, just for the number one, um, you of course provided evidence, so you have very little room to appeal against the decision of the competition authority. Uh, so uh, theoretically, you would end up at civil court the next day, whereas your fellow cartelists who deny the cartel and say test is unus, test is nullus, uh, we were not involved in the cartel, this is it's just false allegations, everything, and we drag it on to the courts, um, and then administrative courts will deal with it for two and a half or three years or four years. I thought Hungarian courts are slow, but um, someone told me in Brussels uh, a couple of times, the days ago, and said, it's four years, yeah, you're very good with that. Okay, I thought it's slow. But um, after a cartel, it will take four years in front of administrative courts. And then it, there will be a decision whether the decision of, of the competition authority is fine or not. But the leniency applicant, by the, after four years, will have paid and will have been through with its whole case. Now, for this reason, it was introduced. No, no. It, for the immunity applicant, there is a specific rule, and its civil law claim has to be stayed. There's no way that the court can deal with its claim as long as an appeal is pending against the decision of the competition authority. Again, this only applies to the immunity applicant. So when you think about whether to do an application or not, uh, it is very pivotal. If you are number two, um, it seems that even with your 50% reduction, you are worse off uh, than if you preserve your possibility to drag it along to the courts, uh, have more time, see what happens, um, and so on. Um, I think one rule is, is the escalation potential, which specifically for a smaller jurisdictions will matter a lot. Is um, um, when you think about whether or not you should be immunity applicant, you should be leniency applicant, or you should, shouldn't do anything, is, is the escalation. In a number of cases, you will have major multinationals with whom you are competing on a number of markets. Do you risk a major conflict with them for a jurisdictions, jurisdiction of the size of Hungary or not? In a number of cases, you will have uh, very important situations where you will have competitors in a given market which are your customers in another market clearly you will not risk an escalation with them. So you will swallow and say, well, no application. Um, and in that sense, internal fact-finding, which was mentioned by Mark, is, is very important. Again, I think it's a big challenge for, an, for us legal practitioners, uh, and we have seen that in the past couple of years, more and more, is our capability of, for forensic work for searching very quickly, very professionally, databases, um, emails, doing interviews, knowing when people are lying to you, bit, being a bit of psycho psychologist, and, and see whether what they are telling is, is the truth. What happens in Hungary, as in many jurisdictions, once you have submitted an application, the authority will make a down raid. Now, exactly not to, in order not to uncover that you were the leniency applicant, there will be a down raid at your premises as well. Uh, and we had one case where, uh, where the authority came out, uh, they did a down raid, and found, in fact, on the laptop, more than we have, which, which we were not aware of either. Uh, and that is, is a suicide situation. Then the authority can simply withdraw your, your uh, immunity, saying you have not cooperated in good faith and fully. Um, so internal fact-finding, rapid one and professional one, is an absolutely key exercise in these types of cases. Um, I think in order to, to stick on time, I, I think I will stop here, although I would have a couple of other slides, but I think these were the major points attached to, to the central view from a, from a jurisdiction which is a, more on the recipient side. Uh, and with that, I think I'll hand over to you know, to Katarina okay. or you, Mark, but, if you have yeah, any comments. Okay. Th thank you, thank you, Garbo. Um, and, and maybe there's, there's still sort of a bit of time to, to discuss matters afterwards, yeah. but thank you for... Oh, and and just, just one comment to Mark's, <laughs> Mark's uh, remark on the Flyderer case. It was decided on Tuesday, so the Court of Justice was very... It's, it's just perfect for the conference that they decide on Tuesday and the conference starts on Wednesday. Although, unfortunately, the decision is not, as Mark said, it's relatively empty. It yeah. says, well... Pros and cons have to be weighted. Um, it's about dec decor papers. Uh, uh, 
and, and so the national court has to think about whether or not to give access to, to those leniency documents. Landmark judgment, but uh, the typical court of justice language um, in it on Tuesday. Okay. Sorry. Thanks, Governor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. The view from